This is the first lecture in our series of lectures on an introduction to blockchain. As a blockchain is a database, I will begin by discussing databases and their role in society, particularly financial databases, and problems in the way databases are currently managed. These problems will motivate what I call the four key design concepts of blockchain. Those are immutability, query consistency, replication, and distributed governance. I'll go into each of these in more detail. Along the way, I'll also touch on the topic of transparency versus privacy, as that will be a key theme throughout the rest of this course. Blockchains are databases. So it makes sense to begin by talking about databases and their role in society. Many aspects of society are reliant on management of digital information, such as digital records of asset ownership, this includes money in a bank account, your WeChat balance, airplane tickets, concert tickets, titles to real estate, or ownership of other physical goods. There are databases that track evidence of transactions, like financial transactions, payments, legal transactions, such as contracts. There are also databases which keep records of identity and credentials such as your credit history, your citizenship, criminal records, or health records. Let's begin with some database basics. There are different ways to organize information in a database. The simplest type of data structure is a set. This is simply a collection of unordered data items. In this example, we have a set of names. Changing the order of names in this set does not change the meaning of the database content. A list is like a set, except that the items in the database are ordered. We may talk about the ith data item, denoted li. An example of this would be an append-only bank ledger, say of bank transactions, where the order of transactions is crucial to the meaning of the database. Another, type of, another way of organizing information in a database is in a key value table. You can think of, as an example, a table of accounts and balances. The main difference between a key value table and a list is that the key column, usually written as the first column, is a collection of unique items. So in this case, every account number is unique. And the records associated with that account number aggregate all the information linked to that account. The state of the database describes the current database content or how it is organized. Transactions are updates that modify this content or organization. So examples would include, say, reordering a list or modifying the balance in an account. Finally, the database log is the historical sequence of database states. The database log naturally forms an append-only list where every transaction transitions from one state to another in the list. The historical log of this database we may denote as ST1 for the first state, then ST2, ST3, and so on and so forth. In a traditional database, there is a single party called the server that manages the database. Now, this single party called the server may be operating the database in a data center that consists of many, many machines, perhaps distributed for fault tolerance. But we will ignore that because we still think of this as a single party, a single entity. The benefit of having a single entity manage the database is that it's highly efficient and simple. But there are several problems, and these problems are going to motivate the design principles of blockchains. So first off, 
the server can modify data without detection. For example, a bank who is managing a database of bank accounts and balances could erase someone's bank account or modify their balance without detection. Perhaps the user would notice this, but the user would not be able to provide any evidence that the bank did anything wrong. There's no proof that modifications that the server made to the data were done incorrectly. The server may also give conflicting information to different people. The bank could tell Alice that there are only $3 in Bob's account, while Bob thinks that he has $5 in his account. Similarly, the server could also hide information from an auditor so that auditors get a different view of the information in the database than the users do. The server governing all updates to the database could also censor transactions, block specific users from being able to access or make changes to the database. It could also do slightly more subtle things such as determining the ordering of transactions to the database. An example of this would be in, say, an exchange. In an exchange, giving preference to particular users to make their transactions go before others could lead to financial gain and is, in fact, in some cases illegal. This is known as front-running. So given those problems with centrally managed databases, we come to the following four key blockchain concepts. These are immutability, query consistency, replication, and distributed governance, or consensus. Let's visit these each individually. Immutability. One way to characterize immutability is that the database cannot be modified without detection. Of course, we would like to allow modifications to the database, otherwise it would not be very useful, but every change to the database is recorded. In other words, immutability refers to mostly the historical log of database states, which cannot be altered. Every update to the database state triggers a new state of the database, and the historical sequence of states cannot be deleted. Query consistency. Query consistency says that two clients querying the database should get the same result. Whether this is an auditor or a regulator or a normal user, they should all have the same view of the information in the database. And inconsistent query results should be detectable. So if user 0 sends query A to the database, getting result A, user 1 sends query A, the same query, and gets the same result A, but then user 2 comes along and gets result Z to query A, that should be detected. Replication is the concept of distributing the storage of the database over many different physical locations, as well as parties who actually have control over access to those physical storage locations. This prevents both data loss or data access censorship. So if a user here queries one of these data centers storing the database and is denied access, the user could go to a different data center and ask the same query in order to get the same result. The last concept is distributed governance, or consensus. Here, multiple servers cooperate in approval or rejection of any transactions to the database. This prevents transaction censorship and also reduces platform risk. Transaction censorship, similar to data access censorship, is where some server, let's say this one over here, blocks a particular user, say Alice, from trying to make a transaction to the database. In the case of distributed governance, Alice could send the transaction instead to some of the other servers who are part of this distributed governance, and at least one of these other servers may be able to push through the transaction 
and get an agreement among the three other data centers to allow the transaction to go through. This also reduces platform risk in the case that one of the data centers participating goes corrupt, tries to change the rules of how the database works, or even simply disappears. The remaining servers who are participating in the governance can continue to provide the same service. Now, why do we call this technology blockchain? What does blockchain have to do with any of the key concepts we just discussed? Well, the term blockchain mostly comes from Bitcoin, which was one of the first real-world systems to realize these principles and key concepts that we just discussed. In Bitcoin, there is a data structure called a chain of block hashes, which serves as what Nakamoto calls a time stamping mechanism. And this sequence of hashes forms what's called a succinct commitment to a historical log of database transactions. Every block contains a sequence of ordered transactions and blocks are fed into this hashing mechanism in order to, fo to, to form a chain of block hashes. The chain of block hashes also plays a special role in Bitcoin's longest chain consensus protocol. Now at this point, you may not know what a hash is or even what we mean by a succinct commitment. So let's begin by going into those concepts. What is a hash function? So a hash function, in short, is a function that takes a large message in some space that we call M, this is called the message space, and it outputs a very short message of fixed size, in this case just 32 bytes. The notation 01 to the 256 we may use to indicate a string of ones and zeros that is of length 256 digits long. This fits in 32 bytes. A collision for H is a pair of distinct messages, M0 and M1, such that the hash of message zero is equal to the hash of message one. Many collisions will exist when the messages can be much longer than the output of the hash function. However, the idea of constructing a collision resistant hash function is to make it difficult to find these collisions. So we say that H is collision resistant if it is hard to find collisions for H. In essence, the attacker cannot do much better than randomly guessing. In fact, the best known attack on collision resistant hash functions is something called the birthday attack. If we just randomly select 2 to the 128 random numbers that are in the range 0 to the 2 to the 256, then at least one pair of numbers will contain a collision with probability close to one half. However, two to the 128 is an insanely large number and it should be infeasible for any adversary to be able to produce or compute those random trials in order to actually find such a collision. Let's look at an application, committing to data. Say Alice has a large file t. She publishes the hash of the file h of t. A little while later, Bob, who has already seen the published hash, now receives a file t prime from Alice and checks that the hash of t prime is equal to h. At this point, Bob is convinced that t prime is equal to t based on the security of H as a collision-resistant hash function, because it is infeasible for Alice to find two different files, T prime not equal to T, such that H of T prime is equal to H of T. As a concrete example of why you might want to do this, 
Let's say that Alice has made a scientific discovery and T is a research publication. Let's say that on March 1st, 2020, Alice wants to claim credit for her discovery, but does not want the world to know the details of her research publication, perhaps because she is filing a patent. So on March 1st, Alice can publish this hash, which is just a 32-byte representation of the information. And Bob, who receives H, or anyone else in the world, could later receive the published article, say two months later, and check that this is consistent with the hash produced on March 1st. The collision resistance security means that H is a binding commitment to the file T. How does this fit into the context of a distributed database? Let's say that we have four parties storing a simple data set A, B, C, D. How could they efficiently check that they're all storing the same data set? A naive thing would be for them to all communicate with one another and send each other their entire data sets to check that they're the same. But this would be inefficient it would incur very high communication and is unnecessary. A more efficient way of doing this would be to use the hash function in order to compute just a 32-byte value, which is a fingerprint of the database. We call this the state hash. It represents the current state of the database. They can all send these hashes to each other and check that they're the same. As long as they're the same, then the parties are convinced with very, very high probability that they all are storing the exact same data set. Now, this did not require collision resistance. It only required that collisions occur with low probability. Now, remember, low probability collisions is not the same as collision resistance. Collision resistance means that not only do collisions occur with low probability, but that it's infeasible to even work really hard to find a collision intentionally. So let's look at a scenario where this matters. Let's say that we have a new party joining the system who does not currently have the data set A, B, C, D. We can think of A, B, C, D as a sequence of transactions. So the first step is to verify that all other parties agree on the same sequence of transactions. This can be done, though, if everyone else has published their hash already, as we explained. Because if they all agree on the same hash, then with high probability, they all agree on the same database. But how can this party then retrieve the actual database? The inefficient way to do this would be to go ask everyone to send their version of the database as a way of ensuring that they get a database that everyone else agrees upon. But that would be inefficient. Instead, the party can go to one of the other parties, let's say this party over here, and download the transaction list from this party and compute its hash. Hash is equal to, or H is equal to, hash of A, B, C and D. As long as H is consistent with the hash value that every other party in the system has published, then the party knows that it would have received the exact same data set if it had gone and downloaded it from anyone else. Now this requires collision resistance. Why? Let's say this party it's downloading from becomes corrupt and wants to trick this new party into accepting a different version of the data set from the one that everyone else in the system agrees on. If it can find a collision A prime, B prime, C prime, and D prime, such that its hash is equal to the same as A, B, C, and D, then it can successfully do so. 
So here we need it to be difficult to actually find collisions in the hash function. We just saw an example of parties ensuring consistency over the state of a database at a fixed point in time. In a database evolving over time, we can use a different mechanism called a chain of hashes in order to ensure that parties not only agree on the current state of the database, but also the historical sequence of states. What we do is we compute the next state hash from the current state hash and a single update. At any point in time, we can call the hash that we have the head of the hash chain. And if we had the previous head, head i, and a new update to the database, then the hash of these together gives us head i plus 1. To be very concrete, let's say that the database started as just a, and the hash head was h1 equals hash of a, and then b was added to the database, so then we computed h2 is equal to the hash of b and h1, and so on and so forth, until we have h4, which is the hash of, this is the type of d, and h3. So h4 is a commitment to the entire history of the database. A went to A and B, went to A, B, C, etc. There is only one unique sequence of previous database states that will compute to this head hash H4. Another thing to note is that this also has an efficiency benefit. As the database grows, say, to be very large over time, then in order to ensure consistency, we don't need to recompute a hash over the entire data set, but rather we can just compute a hash of the small update and the previous hash of the previous state of the database. So this brings us to exactly what we saw in the Satoshi Nakamoto paper, which was a chain of hashes over blocks, and each block was a block of transactions, so really just a batched set of updates to the database. And this hash chain is exactly what we just described here. A blockchain is an example of an authenticated data structure. Before explaining authenticated data structures more broadly, Let's define some terminology. So let's notate the state of a database using the term, um, using the notation st. And a query is a question about the current state of the database. For example, the item at a position in the list or a balance in an account. And the result is the answer. So as I mentioned, authenticated data structures generalize a hash chain. A hash chain is a specific kind of authenticated data structure, which is a binding commitment to a sequence of historical database states, as we saw. Now, this is still inefficient in some sense, because for a new auditor or user to verify the sequence of database states that this head commits to, it must download the entire sequence of states before it can verify anything and recompute the chain of hashes over this sequence of states. It would be really nice to have a more efficient way for a user or auditor to just verify what was the ith state of the database. What was the state of the database at some specific time in history? And to just roll back and retrieve that state and verify against the head hash alone, without downloading the entire list, that this was the authentic state at that point in time. So this is exactly the capability that a more general authenticated data structure would provide us with. An authenticated data structure is a solution to this problem. We may abbreviate an authenticated data structure as ADS. 
Authenticated data structures have three algorithms. There's a commit function, which takes in a state of the database and produces a commitment value C. Think of C as a number. There is an authenticate algorithm, which takes in a state, a query, and a result to that query, and produces a proof that attests to the correctness of this result to the query against the current state. There is a check algorithm which takes in the commitment value C, a given query and result, and a proof, and either accepts or rejects. As for efficiency goals, C and the proof should be tiny, much smaller than the database. Otherwise, otherwise we could just send the, the, the state of the database as a commitment and there would be no need to produce proofs at all because the query and result could be verified directly against the state. So the whole point is to produce C and a proof which are much smaller than, than the state of the database. Verification, or the, the check algorithm, should be very fast, much faster than downloading the database state. For security, it should be infeasible to produce a commitment C, a query Q, and two different distinct results, R1 and R2, and two valid proofs, Pi1 and Pi2, that cause check to accept both results as valid results to this query. In other words, this turns the value C into a commitment to all possible query result pairs that could be asked about the committed state. Now, there may be several different ways of constructing authenticated data structures, achieving different kinds of um, efficiency trade-offs, but also that may only handle certain restricted types of queries and results. If our database is, say, um, let's say our, our database is a set of items, um, S is equal to A, B, C, E, F, and G, then we may only need to be able to support queries uh, that ask for whether a certain item is in the set or not. So A is in the set, but the letter Z is not in the set. If it's a list, then we may want to be able to ask for what is the ith item, li, in the list. So queries would be of the form, uh, what, is, what is l of i? And finally, a key value store, such as an account balance table. In a key value store, we would like to authenticate queries that ask for, say, the balance in a given account, or in other words, the value at a particular database key. So let's go back to thinking about the hash chain or a hash function. A hash function satisfies the first efficiency goal of C being very small because we could commit to the database state as just a hash of the state. However, it doesn't have a way to authenticate any other more fine-grained queries to this state. The only way to verify queries against the state is to download the whole state, resulting in a proof that is as large as the entire database. So this second efficiency goal of making the proof small is not satisfied. And the verification requires downloading, again, the entire database state, so it's not fast. So let's apply this uh, to a simple example of an authenticated append-only ledger. So the append-only ledger state is a pair ili, where li is a list, l1, of i items, l1 through li, and i is equal to the, the length of the list at this point. So this is a current state of the ledger um, after i items have been appended to the ledger. A query of the form jsti should result in the jth item 
of the list li, denoted li of j. If j is greater than i, then this query should fail because it's out of bounds. But if j is less than or equal to i, then we should return li of j, which is equal to LJ, little lj. Authenticate should produce a proof pi that attests to the correctness of li of j. And check would take in ci, i, and j, and accept only if li of j is equal to v. And otherwise, it would fail with overwhelming probability. As for security, it should be infeasible to produce a commitment C and proofs pi1 and pi2 that would cause both check of C, i, j, v, and pi1, as well as check of C, i prime, j, v prime, and pi2 to both accept for either i not equal to i prime or v not equal to v prime. So why did we also include i not equal to i prime? Well, remember that i is the length of the list at a particular point in time. So the commitment is not only a commitment to the items that are in the list, but it is also a commitment to the length of the list. So even for the same value of v and v prime, we should not be able to have the check function except two distinct values of, um, which describe the length of the list, i and i prime. This will be important when we're trying to verify the append only property of a ledger. If we have a commitment to the state of the database at point i and a commitment cj for j greater than i, then this means that any position of the committed list in CI, say LI of K for K less than I, should be exactly the same as LJ of K. Because the append only property says that LJ is equal to LI with other items appended, so li plus 1, etc., through lj. But how do we actually enforce this append-only property? That's not actually enforced by the authenticated data structure itself. That has to be enforced by the network that operates this authenticated append-only ledger. So let's look at the example of a bank server centrally managing an append-only ledger on a public site. And we'll see how the authenticated data structure will play a role. So the goals are, one, anyone should be able to read from the ledger and verify authenticity of the results. Anyone should be able to ask the bank to append data to the ledger. And if the bank deletes data, instead of only appending data, it should be caught. So let's say that we have two users, Alice and Bob, and this bank is maintaining this public ledger. So Alice will make a transaction to add some item A to the ledger. And then the public ledger now has the item A. And the bank will respond with a commitment, C1, C1 is a commitment to the state of the ledger after Alice submitted her item A. So it's a commitment to just A. Now Bob comes along and asks to append an item B to the ledger. The ledger becomes AB. And the bank should respond with the commitment C2. C2 is equal to a commitment of AB. Now, either Alice or Bob at this point could come along, or some auditor, let's say, and make, instead of a transaction, just a query, and ask the bank, hey, what is the current state of the database, or the ledger, and the bank should respond with C2. 
And the auditor could ask a query, like what is the first item in the ledger? And in, in addition to getting C2, it should get the answer, well, the, the position at one, so L of one is equal to A and some proof. And then it could check C2, one A proof, and this should accept. But the problem, of course, is what if the bank sends a different value C2 to the auditor than the value that it sent to Bob? In other words, what stops the bank from telling two different people asking the bank queries or for the current state commitment two completely inconsistent results. How do we enforce query consistency? Detecting and proving query inconsistency is critical for transparency. Let's also distinguish between a public versus a private transparent database. Public means completely open query access to anyone, Private would mean restricted query access. For example, auditability may be restricted to a small set of auditors. Either scenario is very relevant and interesting to consider. The key new tool for detecting and proving query inconsistency that we'll use is a digital signature. What is a digital signature? Unlike a physical signature, which is added to a physical document and easily forgeable, digital signatures are a function of the document and mathematically unforgeable. There are three algorithms that make up a digital signature scheme. There's a key gen function, which randomly generates a public key and secret key pair. So this public key, this is the public key, and this is the secret key. Uh, sometimes the secret key is called a private key, same thing. There is a sign function which outputs a signature on a message M given access to the secret key. And then there is a verify function which does not have access to the secret key but only the public key and it verifies a purported signature sigma on the message M and either rejects or accepts. The correctness property of these algorithms guarantees that for any message M, if public key and secret key were generated using keygen, and sigma is the output of sign on some message using the private key, then verify should always accept. As for security, Security says that it's infeasible for any adversary, given only the public key and not access to the secret key, to be able to forge a signature on some message, some fresh message of its choice. More precisely, even if the adversary may request to see correct message signature pairs, mi sigma i of its choice, so let's say pairs m1 sigma 1 through mn sigma n, which, for example, it may request from the true owner of the public key who knows the secret key, then it should still be infeasible for this adversary to produce a valid signature on a new fresh message m star distinct from any of the mi's that it has signatures on. So how do we use digital signatures to detect query inconsistency? So the bank is going to publish a public key and keep secret a secret key for a digital signature scheme. Whenever the bank sends a state commitment to Alice or Bob, it will additionally sign that state commitment. So here, sigma one is equal to sign, the output of sign on using the secret key and the message IC1. 
Remember that i is a sequence, a state sequence number. So over time, the ledger evolves from its first state, and as items are being appended, we have l1, l2, l3, etc. li is a list of length i, and then lj is a list of length j, and let's say that j is greater than i. So Alice is retrieving a commitment to li, and Bob is receiving a commitment to lj. If i is equal to j, okay, if Bob and Alice are querying for the exact same state of the database, and the commitments are different, then the signatures are evidence that the bank lied to either Alice or Bob. More generally, we can also detect violations of the append-only property. So if Alice asks for IC1 and Bob asks for JC2, and the bank signed both of these responses, and additionally Alice and Bob are given authenticated query responses to items in these lists. So let's say Alice gets, for k less than i, gets li of k, is equal to v, and Bob gets lj of k is equal to v prime. Well, the append only property says that it is a violation if v is not the same as v prime. The kth position in the list lj should be the same as the case position in the list li. So if Alice and Bob both receive these authenticated query responses, to two different values of the kth position in their lists, such that check validates through and accepts, then again, these signatures are evidence that the bank lied. Query inconsistency is not the only kind of cheating that can be detected. We could also enforce, more generally, a set of public rules on the server that commit new transactions. So simple examples would be new records of asset ownership may be created only if previous records were marked invalid. So we can't create a new record of ownership for a house unless we cancel the previous record that listed it under a different owner's name. We can also add a rule that money can only be added to Alice's account if removed from some other account. That is a property of money. Another way of do, uh, another requirement could be that moving money from Bob's account to Alice's account actually requires a digital signature from Bob. This is a different use of the digital signature. And actually, following up on that, let's visit that in more depth. There is this new concept here of digital ownership that we get out of using digital signatures. In traditional digital finance, the bank is the complete and full custodian, meaning that the bank attests to customers' ownership of money or other assets. The bank could lie at will, the database is only internal to the bank, and there's no real way to prove the truth. An auditor will, or regulator or another customer will simply ask the bank for verification of whatever the funds are in someone's account. Using digital signatures, we can instead put the user in control so that the user determines ownership over any digital token. In the example of a bank, the bank operates if the bank is operating on a transparent database, as we saw, then we can give every account in the database a public key. The bank cannot undetectably modify Bob's account without Bob's digital signature. That is a new rule that we can add. Then Bob can prove ownership directly to any other user or auditor with query access by providing a digital signature for the public key on his account.
Taking this a step further, the public key could even replace any identity-based form of ownership. So traditionally, the only way to own something is to have some record in some database which has your name and identity and perhaps your government ID or address, other forms of identity verification, which says that you then own this object, whether it's money or some physical object or something else. However, if there is a public key in your account, then that could be enough, even without any other form of identity-based records. The account is in some sense owned by the unique user who knows the secret key for the public key on that account. In other words, the unique user who can produce a valid digital signature. So now Bob doesn't really need an identity on his account at all. The public key is enough. Now, of course, in many applications, this may not be a desirable property, and so one could always add a combination of public keys and identity-based records. And we'll revisit that later in the course. So to look at an example, just a simple example, we could have a database of public key asset records where every record has three fields, a public key, the type of asset, so in this case, for example, 10 cent stock, and say the units of that asset type. A transaction, which would require a digital signature, in this case, for the public key X876 for K2M, would erase this record and create two new records one which is under this which is owned by the same public key and another which is owned by a new public key and the balances would now add up to the original balance so this transaction is basically moving three units of 10 cent stock to a new public key zhy876j7l one topic we have not touched on yet is privacy a blockchain system with the properties described so far is by nature fully transparent. The privacy challenge is how can you achieve privacy without destroying the integrity of the system? In other words, without destroying the verifiability of transaction rules and policies and query consistency that did not rely on any trust in the server. Privacy is also very important and may be critical for real-world applications? The answer is using a combination of encryption and zero-knowledge proofs. In fact, as we will see as we dive into this topic more deeply in a later lecture in the course, we actually use a, a combination of hiding commitments similar to a hash commitment. A hiding commitment has the property that it absolutely hides the underlying data, as well as encryption and zero-knowledge proofs. But we won't go into that right now. Finally, the last key concept is governance. So what are problems, again, with a centrally managed transparent database? We solved some of the issues that we talked about with centrally managed databases. However, even in a transparent, centrally managed database, the server can still violate the rules openly. Even if it can't evade detection, it can still violate the rules. It could even openly change the rules. It could also still censor transactions or shut down service, disappear. And in doing so, the server can cause confusion. Even if users are able to detect query inconsistency, they may not be able to resolve that inconsistency and the state of some financial system may be very messed up at that point in time. In a financial database, causing confusion can lead to huge losses of money. Also consider that the value of a network increases with the number of users and essentially controlled system leads to monopolization, 
where users would rather accept changes than leave, net, than leave the network because the cost of leaving that network is just too high. So how do we reduce these risks? One answer is distributed governance. There could be many different forms of distributed governance. The simplest would be a forced change of power. Let's say a bank operating a financial database is corrupt and users can detect that, then perhaps the users could simply revolt. Perhaps a new bank could take over operating the state of the financial database from where it previously left off. However, this is chaotic, has a high social cost, data could be lost in the process, and would lead to confusion. Leader elections are perhaps a more stable way of running distributed governance. This would require specifying voting power, who can participate in the voting, as well as when elections occur, so some schedule for elections. However, what happens when the current leader violates the rules between election periods? Then again, this could lead to a chaotic transition period. Algorithmic consensus aims to integrate voting seamlessly into the day-to-day -day operations of the system in order to avoid such chaotic transition periods. For example, every update to the database could be voted upon and the protocol would ensure consistency and agreement among all eligible participants. There are many different ways of running algorithmic consensus that achieve different properties. And we will look at this in much more detail in a later lecture in this course. So with that, we conclude our introductory lecture to blockchain.